So welcome every to, everyone to the show today. A little bit of a different format today. You get to see uh, Rick and myself showing our smiling faces on camera. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, if you're listening to this on the podcast and just go over to YouTube and you can see our smiling faces there. So for those that don't know Rick, Rick's a, a veteran. He's a former volleyball coach. He's also a cybersecurity sales professional. And currently he's working as a security product specialist. He's working on his PhD in cyber psychology. So I think that's 2025. I think I'd seen you're going to graduate that. Um, so after 2025, you have to call him Dr. Rick. Uh, he holds a number of industry certifications, and he's also the host of a podcast called the Cyber Pro Podcast that's been around for a few years. Um, so Rick, do you mind just sharing about that? And uh, real quick before you do that, I'm fortunate enough to be episode number 300 on their podcast, which is coming up, I believe, uh, around the end of February. Rick can share more details on that. But think of it this way, Google search the movie 300 and just picture the main character of that movie with a dad bod. And that'll be Ken on episode 300 of the Cyber Pro podcast. So without further ado, Rick, do you mind just sharing a little bit about the podcast, what you guys talk about on there and, uh, and what they should expect, especially with my episode and how much cursing there is? <laughs> For sure, Ken. Actually, now we're going to have to go back and put Leonidas up on the side of the screen so there's a comparison. So yes. I'll make sure that gets edited. And yeah, Ken's going to be our 300th episode of the Cyber Pro Podcast, which is super exciting. We are going to be launching that on Leap Day, so February 29th. So everybody can't forget that. You are unforgettable in yourself, but we're excited to actually see that release. The Cyber Pro Podcast was created a couple of years ago by me because, well, I wanted to build a better network. I wanted to give people a platform to talk about what they loved, what they were in insightful about. And at first we had, <clears throat> a lot of founders, a lot of entrepreneurs. And since then, it's gone all over. We've had students, we've had first year security operations analysts, we've had CEOs, we've had VPs of large Fortune 50 companies, and people have just really bought into the idea that we ask three to five similar questions in the podcast. We break up additional bonus content about what they're experts in, and we just give them the whole week to Give us their insights. So that's what we're looking to continue to do. And, and Ken, you get to be our 300th. Well, I appreciate that, man. Um, and by the way, Rick has not had Beyonce yet on the show. So Beyonce, if you're listening to this, which I know you listen to my podcast, of course, uh, give Rick a call and, and get on the show. So today we're going to talk about incident response. But before we do that, because we like to enjoy ourselves in life, Rick, I want to get your thoughts. There's a huge debate online and not really, it's just a debate <laughs> in my own head, but <laughs> The debate is this, who is more handsome? Is it Green Berets or Navy SEALs? So for the audience out Whoa. there, before Rick answers, he's going to think about this. This is a very tough question. For the audience out there listening or watching this over on YouTube, let us know in the comments, who is more handsome, Army Green Berets or Navy SEALs? So Rick, what are your thoughts on that? Man, you know, I'm, I, it's everybody in your comments is going to add two things. First off, if they're Marine, they're always going to say Marines and we should just delete those comments immediately. Sorry, Marines. I respect you, but you're not handsome. <laughs> and, and then the next group of folks is going to jump in there are the army Rangers. Again, sorry, Rangers. You guys are cool dudes. I, I served with a bunch of you that had that triple canopy on your sleeve, but it's, it's gotta be the green berets, the seals. You guys are better at your job than us, but we're pretty. We're definitely pretty guys, so. <laughs> well, there you go. You have it, everyone. Uh, let us know in the comments. And you know there's going to be at least one Coast Guard and at least one Air Force in there. Like, look, Air Force is the greatest. Um, but we forgive all of you for doing that, and we we know the truth. Now that Rick shared the truth of us, we know the truth. So anyways, without further ado, let's just dive in. So I think most people listening to this probably have an idea, and many of them have probably done instant response, but maybe for some of the newer people that are that are trying to get into cybersecurity, they've heard incident response, they might have an idea of what it is, or maybe Beyonce is listening. She has no clue what incident response is. We love you, Beyonce. Um, can you just share, like, what is, first off, what is incident response, at least in your definition, and and why is it so important for organizations out there? Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, honestly, just real quick, if Beyonce and Taylor Swift wanted to write a song for us, they could. We would totally accept that. Um, <laughs> but... You know, incident response is an interesting beast, right? I mean, I think <clears throat> I think people oftentimes talk about incident response from the standpoint of I'm responding to something bad happening. But 
we start being more proactive with the planning stage, right? And it's a response plan, a business continuity plan, or a disaster recovery plan. All three of those have a place in your infrastructure. Without those plans, without understanding and preparing for what you need to respond to, you're likely going to have issues and oftentimes fail. And I think <clears throat> the focus is often on reactive response instead of being proactive through that preparedness. You know, we talked about and made some jokes about who's the more attractive, uh, you know, special operations team. Well, as a special operator, it doesn't matter. You could put all of us in the same room. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to throw our ranks out the door and we're all going to sit around a table and figure out how can we prepare for every type of bad thing that could happen? Every little bit of problematic issues that could arise. And we're going to attack that problem from 360 degrees, right? Looking at it from every window, from every skylight, from every door. How can we break through without firing a single round? And understand that if that has to occur, your response has already been trained. You know what your response protocols are. You know how to protect yourself and the people around you. And I think people forget that the best response is a good plan. So I think you brought up something good there, kind of subconsciously, if, if you will. We often talk about like diversity of thought. And I think your example you gave there, special operations teams coming together, um, again, cross-functional team, right? SEALs, Green Beret, some Rangers in there. Um, I guess we'll throw a PJ in there from the Air Force. But anyways, uh, maybe a compact controller. We need somebody that can work the radio. Uh, but you, you brought up a good point, right? That diversity of thought, because I can think through scenarios, Rick can think through different scenarios, someone else based on their their background, their experience, their life experiences, they think of other things that might've happened that I never thought of, right? So that's why it's so important. And we we talk a lot about diversity in cybersecurity. And yes, that uh, of course means you know race. So they're not all, all a bunch of pale white guys like myself, but also that means diversity of thought, which diversity of thought is honestly the most important part of that. Because when you focus on that, you naturally get, people that look differently, that come from different ethnicities, that come from different backgrounds. Um, I mean, you could have two pale white people like me in the room. One came from a millionaire family. One grew up very poor like me, totally different experiences and, and thoughts to contribute to the, you know, solving the problem. So I think you, you brought up a very good point there that, that it, it really takes a team effort and, and, and we tap into all those people's experiences um, and especially run into the response, right? We, we've all worked at different organizations. We've seen different ways of doing things. Um, just because we do it a certain way at, at Ken Incorporated doesn't mean that that's the best way. Because maybe Rick's got a better idea because of it. they've experienced different things at his company and that he comes in, shares his thoughts, and now we can build a better IR team and better response to anything that happens because we've got that diversity of thought. So when we think of incident response, you know, just kind of based on your own experience, Rick, are there some like, so let's say I'm somebody kind of newer coming in to, to my first cybersecurity role as like a SOC analyst or cybersecurity analyst. And, and okay, now I'm plugged into incident response, but I'm still like low on the totem pole, right? Like they're not going to be like, can run this thing, right? Day one. They better not. Otherwise you should run from that company. <laughs> but, but are there certain things I should expect? Like are some challenges that, <laughs> that you've kind of gone through that, might help those people out there that are getting into this area or even those that are experiencing incident response. Is, are there any, some of the things you've experienced in your career that are maybe some challenges and maybe talk about how you overcame them, whether as an individual or as a team? Yeah, I think, you know, I think you're not far off about, you know, you don't want to put the onus on the new, on the new person coming in the room that, you know, fresh faced, but you have to remember they're still part of your team. They, they may have picked up an educational component, or like you mentioned, they may have, a different life experience. One of my colleagues that I worked with when I was doing um, investigative response, you know, forensics and things like that. Uh, you know, the the boss was a former Delta Force guy, you know, I was a Green Beret, and this guy came in and he used he used to do construction, right? He owned his own home building, and the first thing he came in and saw as we were trying to you know educate him on on how to do a investigation was, well, this is like looking for the electrical cables running next to your plumbing. When I build a house, I need to make sure that they're separate. And he had such a different perspective on how to unearth the root cause problem that we actually sat back and said, oh, well, tell us about that. Let's let's consider that. We're 
we're old and we don't want to, we don't, we don't want to change, but we should change. And so remembering that that person is still part of your team, even though they're raw or, or, or inexperienced, doesn't mean that they don't have something to add. But the biggest challenge is, I think, is just buying. <clears throat> we see a lot of companies and, and, and our customers specifically, we talk to them about getting buy-in, not just from your IT and cybersecurity team. Usually those are small teams, right? Less than a dozen, less than three, right? It might be just one, you know, one woman, one man sitting in a room. You have to get buy-in from all of the organization, right? You need buy-in from your financial officers, your board. You need buy-in from your HR department. And if you can't get buy-in, you're always going to be battling uphill. And so I know it sounds so simple, but that is the biggest challenge we face is when you create this, this plan, when you look to build out your technology stack, if you don't have the buy-in because they're more focused on business operations or something else, then you have to find a way to create your program that aligns with their goals so they will then buy into what you're doing. Hundred percent. I think you know, and and I think we've gotten better mm -hmm. over the years as as an industry of showing that relationship between cyber and the business unit, um, or the the business objectives. And I'll say on that, there's there's a book called uh, I'm going to butcher it probably, um, but CISO Evolution I think is the name of the book. I I always I always think of books and I'm like, dang, what was the title? You know, like I had it a minute ago. Anyways, I believe that's I think it's a CISO Evolution, something like that. But I like I like in there, especially for entry level people that don't under, necessarily understand how to speak the language of business, but they're very technical. I like that book because it, it breaks down like what are some of the things that that person on the other side of the business is looking at. And then you, and then it explains to you like how you can plug in what you're doing into a, a format or a meaningful information for them. So they say, oh, that's a great idea, Rick. Like, we should do that. Here's a budget. Um, you're still not going to get the budget you want. Let's full disclaimer. You're, you're not going to get the budget you want whatsoever. Um, but at least that way you're communicating in the language that they understand. It'd be like if, you know, Rick was fluent in Spanish and I understand Spanish, but my Spanish speaking is pretty much hola. And that's not going to be enough to get right. So like we'd be speaking different languages, but if I use a translator app or, you know, I brought a translator with me or I learned, you know, I, I worked on my Spanish again, I used to speak it pretty well years ago. Um, then I could communicate better with Rick. Right. So it's really just learning that language of how he communicates and, and, you know, vice versa. Um, you, you talked about planning. So, I mean, is there anything else that an organization out there can do to try to, to try to really ensure that they're resilient against emerging threats besides just, you know, I mean, cause you can't plan for everything um, as much as we want to, like, there's always something that like, how the hell did that happen? Right. Um, cause you just can't plan for everything. So is, are, is there any like other steps or process that you go through that, that are kind of like, okay, well, if we do, can't plan for everything, here's like, you know, sort of the plan B, if you will. Yeah. I'm a big proponent of, education through threat intelligence. And so there are so many different automated programs that'll send you threat intelligence feeds and understanding what's happening in the market today. <clears throat> you know, just knowing what what 8Ks are being deployed, you know, what which companies have been breached, how they've been breached. You don't have to be a technical nerd to understand the overall process, right? We understand that most of it's social engineering, some of it's vulnerability or patch management, but in the end, if you even even have a weekly threat intelligence report that comes to your desk and you take 15, 20 minutes to review it, you're going to start thinking and get those creative juices flowing on how you can incorporate that threat response into your planning stages. You know, now you also need to do some form of practice, right? You should do a tabletop exercise or or work internally with your teams to say, okay, if this were to happen, is there a break point in our plan? And just walk through it. You know, it could be as simple as just having a 30 minute conversation with your team and the, and the, those outside of your team that are part of the response, but that's the best way, you know, and, and, and I recommend weekly having that threat intelligence report. And I recommend quarterly doing some form of practice against it. It's time consuming and you have other things to do, but think about, the hour you put into this every month for threat intelligence or the three or four hours of table topping every quarter, now your incident response plan, instead of taking 
four days to complete the response, it takes less than 12 hours, right? Because you've taken all that pre-time. So that's that's one of the big things we focus on when we talk about resilience. So really what you're what you're saying, Rick, is I, I should not be a firefighter that at the last minute as the fire is going, tries to figure out how the hose hooks up to the, the fire hydrant. And I should like actually practice that so I can put out the fire effectively. So um, I, I think great information there. So I want to pivot a little bit to kind of more the career seeker. You know, we kind of talked on the business side, honestly, more the, the intermediate to senior level. But for someone out there that's like, yes, incident response, I want to be a, a Green Beret incident responder like Rick without going to the, the Q course. So I'm just going to do incident response. Like what, what do I do if I'm out there? Like, are there certain things I should be learning? Um, and obviously we can't dive in the weeds on that because there's a million things that you can learn based on where you're going. But like, are, are there some like resources you recommend? Is there kind of a process? Is there a way, certain way to, to like craft a resume or a LinkedIn profile? Like what is Rick's advice? Like if someone came to you like, Rick, I want to pay you $10 million to coach me how to get an entry-level job working in incident response. What do I need to know? Here's 10 million so you can retire. Just tell me what I need to know, Rick. I'll do it for a million people. Let's talk. Oh, real. you get it. That's 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 the that's the ten dis, that's the Ken discount. So y'all you get the Ken discount right now. <laughs> there you go. So, <laughs> you know, I tell a lot of people you have to research it, but you have to research the right areas, right? Go to those places that are already teaching you things. Go to your university if you're if you're going that path. If you're going down the certification path, right? Look and see what CompTIA or SANS Institute or any of those main you know uh, groups are doing become a member of your ISSA or your ISC squared groups, and <clears throat> then research all of the different cybersecurity professional roles that are out there. You know, I jumped into cybersecurity in an in investigation because the guy who ran the company was a former soldier that I served with. And he's like, you'd be great at this. Let's go have fun with it. And I'm like, oh, here we go. So, you know, I got thrown into it, but I was mentally prepared and I think this is the big thing when you do the research, also consider what it takes to prepare your mind for that type of role, right? It's easy to go into sales, uh, no offense to myself, I am in a sales role right now, but it's easy to go into sales, but a security operations center, analysts, engineers, threat intelligence, threat hunting, threat response, right? Incident response, especially have different levels of mental stress and rigor. And so if you're not prepared for that, you you have taken a huge disservice to yourself. And, and what I mean by that is you are going to burn out because it is like being in combat. Incident response, if you're a responder and you're good at it, you are constantly trying to reactively and efficiently respond to something bad that's happening. And while you're not getting shot at, right, or you're not getting bombed, you're still sitting in a room going, oh, this is insane. I need to figure this out. I need to stop this from happening. Why does Barb in accounting keep clicking on cat videos and all that other fun stuff? But I need to be mentally prepared for that. And so as you research those professional roles, I recommend you go on LinkedIn, you do a quick search of people who have done it for five, eight, 10, 20 years, and you simply reach out and say, hey, could I take 20 minutes of your time could I talk to you about what the job looks like, how I can become certified, and then how can I stay in the, in the role as long as possible? I would say 90% of the professionals in the market are going to give you those 20 minutes, and they're going to give you some great insights. Uh, I consistently, once a month, talk to at least a handful of students, high school and college, and it's an open forum. I, I just simply say, anyone who's interested that's a high school or college student looking to get into the role, I'm going to give you guys 20 minutes to ask me just a barrage of questions. And they love it. They, they get it. And I feel like they are going to be better prepared. So I'll just add there, make sure you have a LinkedIn <clears throat> profile picture because a lot of, uh, a lot of analysts are going to be like, oh, you must be a threat actor that's trying to get me. So um, the more you are actually like a human, uh, the better off it is. And, and you may not, you know, Rick's a little different. Many people may not do a phone call with you, but they may say, look, you can just, you know, shoot me your questions via DM. So have your questions ready. If they yeah. say that, that way you can send them over. So you, they're, you're not like, oh, I'll get back to you in three weeks. They're going to forget all about you. You're going to get buried under a thousand other messages. So just, I mean, just general networking one-on-one stuff, right? Like the, that I see a lot of people for some reason don't do. So <laughs> so please do that. Make sure you're a real person. Um, some of you have very sketchy 
looking LinkedIn profiles. So get your profile right. I've got free videos on the YouTube channel on how to do that. Get all that stuff in order, then reach out and you'll get, you're more likely to get a response and especially the response you want and not a F you. So um, I'll, I'll leave that there. Uh, and, and by the way, Rick, Rick kind of brought this up in passing, but if you are working or if you get hired as an instant response role and you find yourself being shot at, it's probably not the right job for you. You should probably move into some other area of cyber or a different company because you really shouldn't be getting shot at. Although if you work in the government space doing this stuff, you may get uh, some other governments not happy with you and we'll leave, leave that like it is because um, I know some people in that area. Uh, so Rick, I, I mean, any any final <clears throat> thoughts or advice you want to share with the audience? It could be around instant response, could be around cybersecurity in general, sales, could be life advice. Uh, you could share your password if you want to. It's kind of up to you. The floor is yours, Rick. <laughs> No, I, I appreciate that, Ken. I, I think it's education and awareness, like Ken's podcast, like the Cyber Pro podcast, like all of the different events and conferences you can go to. You know, maybe you're not jumping straight into the deep end and going to Black Hat every year, but maybe you're working up towards it. Maybe you're going to DEF CON, maybe you're doing some of your local ISS, uh, ISSA stuff and, and just really trying to dig in. I think the most important thing that I've learned from cybersecurity, right? I, I can go and put an incident response plan into place, uh, you know, in 30, 60, 90 days, I can practice it. I can do everything right. <clears throat> and you're still going to have failures. And until everyone is willing to share those failures and not worry about this cone of silence or secrecy around cybersecurity, we're always going to be on the defensive. And so go network, go, go talk to your you know, your brothers and sisters in arms, for lack of a better term, and just simply go be open because the bad actors know what you're doing, whether you're trying to be quiet or not and secretive about it. So just instead of making a, a new mousetrap, go make a better one that you can just protect your organization and everyone else's.